Okay, we're done. So that was good. The uh, the whole uh, climate change uh, issue uh, dealt with and, uh, and and tidied up. Um, did you did you want to say anything? Do you have any comments on anybody else's presentation, or or do you want to release these poor folks back into the wild? No, I'm sure someone else has some. I'm sure someone else has some questions. Come on. Come on. Yeah, what do you yeah, always yeah. wanted to ask a climate scientist? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps this is overly general a question, um, but as a layperson kind of coming into, let's say, a conference like this or reading Conrad Black's lovely newspaper, um, sometimes I feel a little bit lost between what's um, a modest estimate, a conservative estimate. Is there anything that functions as essentially um, a normal case scenario scoreboard for how we're doing as a species in custody of our planet? <laughs> that's a great idea. Oh, we should have such a thing. I don't think such a thing exists, but that, that's that's really good. Well, it, you're, 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 absolutely, you're absolutely right. I mean, like, you know, what's conservative, what's normal, what's expected? These things change day by day, and, and when people use these words, you often have no idea what they actually mean. Um, so uh, having a, a quantified thing where you could actually say exactly what these things meant uh, and how we were doing, I think would be a great idea. I, I interpreted your question a little bit differently, which is, you know, where do you go for... Um, information that might be sort of middle of the road or more... more. Oh, okay. Well, that's it. I mean, it, that's a really, uh, you know, in today's day and age, there's information everywhere and you can pull things off the internet uh, with impunity. And, and so it is important to think about where you get your information. I think as a scientific community, uh, first of all, a lot of scientists work. Uh, Gavin is a good example of someone who works uh, to communicate uh, his knowledge as a scientist to the lay public through things like blogs. But I think, you know, one of the best bets is to go to um, agencies and organizations where what their, their findings represent is a broad consensus within the scientific community. And, you know, I mentioned the IPCC. Uh, a lot of us think of some of the things that the IPCC reports as conservative. If you imagine trying to get 2,000 scientists to agree on certain points, you might imagine that they can agree on certain things that are unassailable and other things that they leave as still uh, being discussed. And one of the examples of that was in the 2007 report when they reported on uh, sea level rise. And at the time, there were a lot of uh, things that were emerging about the dynamics of ice sheets and how they melt under global warming scenarios. But it was still research that was being worked out and refined. And, and what uh, the, the report and what the scientists decided to do was only report on the sea level rise associated with uh, the expansion due to the, the warming of the oceans, to mention the fact that these dynamic features were out there, but not include them in their official uh, sea level rise estimates. And that's a very clear example of a situation where what was reported was a very conservative projection of what the sea level rise was expected to be. Uh, and the science since that time has evolved and matured, and it's been revised upwards by 50 to 100 percent. So the sea level rise projections at that point uh, were conservative. The point being is, is that I think that when, uh, if you really want the consensus view, go to the scientific organizations, go to the IPCC, these places where they represent a broad consensus of the scientific community, and put less weight on individual opinions and, and uh, reporting, because I think that you know everyone has a perspective, but it's, it's very important to build consensus. Uh, I was just going to add the, the National Academies uh, do a really good job on that kind of stuff. So, so don't read what you don't, don't believe what you read on my blog, but, but read what <laughs> the National Academies say. They do, they do very good jobs. Alan Savory gave a TED talk regarding um, de increase in desertification and has also increased the climate, increase, increased the weather. Um, and I was just wondering your take on that, like if we increase grasslands, like could do you really believe that has a change in in climate? There's not an awful lot of evidence that modification of the land surface causes a significantly strong effect on the climate above it. Um, there are a few exceptions. The Dust Bowl is one, which was one of the, you know, so the, the United States in the 1930s was one of the most significant human-induced perturbations to a land surface that has ever occurred. And it seems to have had a clear intensification of the drought. But the more commonly asserted one is the Sahel of um, Africa, the, the, the southern shore of the Sahara Desert, where the whole idea of desertification was originally induced by an eminent MIT meteorologist, Jules Charney.
Um, it, we now know that that doesn't seem to have really had um, the, the, the impact of grazing and transformation of the savanna region there by farmers and, and um, herd, people herding um, livestock doesn't seem to have had a significant effect and in fact that's a region where there was a, tr a trend towards drier conditions from the 60s through to the 90s and it's now been largely reversed and people have moved back. Um, the landscape there, the vegetation seems to be able to respond remarkably quickly to changes in, in precipitation. So um, land surface changes and impacts on atmosphere, it's still something that is, is, is being looked at a lot, but relative to say the influence that ocean conditions have on climate around the world, I would say it is small. And I can tell Gavin's itching to disagree with me. Well, no, no I'm, I'm not going to disagree completely. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think you're right. The, 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 the savanna margins, like the, you know, planting grasses and the rain following the grass, right? Uh, that, that I agree is, is not uh, is, is not very well supported. But but like large scale deforestation in the Amazon, uh, that does have an impact. It has an impact on water recycling. It has an impact on rainfall. Uh, the deforestation in Europe that occurred mainly, you know, you know I mean now many hundreds of years ago, uh, had an impact on climate. The uh, deforestation of the of the uh, the U.S. and the reforestation after the population crash when Columbus uh, after after Columbus discovered um, uh, Hispaniola, uh, those things did have impacts on on climate. Uh, they're there, they're detectable, um, but in terms of like how big they are uh, compared to the changes that we're seeing because of greenhouse gases, uh, it's it's small. I mean. It's interestingly, it's interesting scientifically, um, but of uh, kind of second order in terms of where we're going. Uh, I think there's a vast population of our uh, leadership, global and national, and a vast population of Ill um, uh, global and national constituents who simply don't understand this. Um, today's analogy to baseball is like a mind opener because it's a handy implement for informing the public at large. It would be very nice to engage our public to become part of the future in this particular way. Perhaps it would help. So, uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, that, that analogy, actually, the, uh, the weather on steroids, um, actually gets a lot of play in the press uh, the last few months. Um, and, and you're right, it is, you know, people, people understand these things uh, when, you, when you speak in terms of uh, metaphors uh, that are appropriate uh, quite handily. I think the, the bigger problem that we have in, in talking to the public, though, is that the public have lots of other things on their minds, right? You know, that they're, they're worrying about their paycheck, they're worrying about unemployment, their health benefits, you know, their house, which has been flooded, you know. There's, uh, there's a lot of demands on people's attention. You know, I mean, what are the, what are the Kardashians doing today? I mean, <laughs> that's very important. Uh, so, you know, we're not as interesting as that, in some sense. Um, I think we're more important. This issue is more important. Um, but, uh, you know, but people don't always want to be thinking about important things. Uh, and, and so finding ways to, to break through into people's kind of self-imposed bubbles uh, is, is, is tough. Yeah, but then you get accused of propagandizing, and then you just get, you know, and then that, that undermines your credibility as a scientist, you know. So uh, it, there's only so much you can do there. But, you know, but people are trying in all sorts of different ways. I mean, I'm certainly doing my best, and, and these guys are doing their best, and, and lots of other people within the community are also uh, doing a lot more in terms of outreach at, at all different levels, at, at the city level, at the public level, at church levels, um, at the federal government level. Um, we're, making, we're making progress, but it's slow and it isn't enough. Um, I, I would put it um, slightly differently to the way you did because I think you know the public is, um, if anything, you know more concerned and aware and concerned of these issues than government leaders are, mm -hmm. um, at least federal level government leaders are. So, um, but the when you look at um, when you ask people whether they believe global warming is real and whether humans are responsible for it, 
the responses come back and they are completely predictable based on ideological lines. It's, you know, it's an overwhelming uh, majority. Only in the U.S.? Not, in the U.S. In, 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 in the U.S. It's, yeah. a, it's an overwhelming majority of people who vote Democratic, and it's a minority of people who vote Republican. So, and the Republicans actually tend to have higher levels of education than, than, than Democrats, actually, because of, they're wealthier. Um, so it doesn't, whether people believe in global warming and look at the scientific evidence and think it's something of concern and something that humans are responsible for has no correlation with their education level whatsoever. So what people are believing is being dictated a priori by what they want the answer to be. And, and you know, sci climate science is not the only thing like that. Economics is another one. Um, and so I think it's, you know, just knowledge transfer is in and of itself and explaining the science in and of itself is not going to get us to a solution. I think we all have our opinions on this. I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I also think it's um, not entirely accurate to think about this as a vacuum, where if scientists would just step forward to fill it, it would uh, solve the problem, whether through different ways of communication. And I, we all have um, you know, work to do to think about how to communicate our science more effectively to the lay public, and I'm in complete support with that. But you know, the, the, the fact is, is that it's not a vacuum. There's actually a lot of noise out there. It's not just the Kardashians. There's a lot of uh, noise with regard to um, the way people look at the actual science. And Gavin showed some good examples of figures that were misleading. And I think that what exists out there in terms of uh, confusion and, and the gentleman that asked about where do I go for uh, you know appropriately sourced information, it's a really hard task to actually establish, um, to cut through the noise with the principal message about what we know, what we understand, and what the threats are. And so I wouldn't excuse us from having a big job to do, and I think that we absolutely have to engage, but I think we also have to acknowledge that there are a lot of other things, either randomly or by design, uh, that make our message, in some cases, difficult to get out because of how much... Uh, noise and argument there is out there uh, by people who are either doing it honestly or not. The so my point is, is there is a way, there are vehicles to um, kindly nudge the population into engagement and productive um, support for implementation. Thank you. The, the drought Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, that the drought cost taxpayers thirty billion dollars. Was that right? In, yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah. Where well, my question is, where do those dollars go? Are they to subsidize the farmers' losses, or like where, basically where does that money go? And two, who's bearing the brunt of yeah, yeah. those crop yields decreasing? Basically, like no There's, one's no one's going hungry in a first world country, but like where's that lack of food going? Well, no one goes hung. Not many people go hungry in the United States. But there was a there was a huge um, drop in crop production within the United States in 2011, and then last year in 2012. I, I could have. There is a plot of that. I mean, it's a remarkable outlier. Um, the amount of lost production for corn in 2012 was equivalent to the total U.S. production in around about 1960s. So it's um, it was a lot. And there's a system of federal federally backed crop insurance that farmers buy into and there's a payout for that. However, there's not enough money went into it in order to pay out this and that's always the case. So the tab just falls on the, the federal tax bill, the taxpayer. So that's how that money and it just goes directly to, to farmers. So farmers within the United States will often see, will not see much of a drop in farm income during a drought when their crops fail because the lost income is compensated for by federal payouts. 
Um, and you can argue whether that's a good system or a bad system, but it's the, the way it, it's the way that it has um, worked here for a, for a back. I mean, th this is a system that was initially set up after the 1930s Dust Bowl drought, which in many ways was like a bifurcation point in the social and economic history of the much of the U.S. agricultural production. Hi there, guys. Um, I have a a question. It's not necessarily my viewpoint, but it's one that I do read about, and I'm just curious, since we have three esteemed climate scientists here, what your opinions might be oh, on this. Oh, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> so let's say, that I'm, uh, <laughs> let's say that I'm someone that, that, yes, I agree with all this, but so what? I think that 100 years from now we'll just adapt, migrate, more people <clears throat> live in the northern latitudes, and generally I think the everyone will just be slightly better off in a warmer planet. What would, what's, the res, what's the response to something like that from the experts? So if we, if we were starting out and we, and we had our own whole um, uh, civilization to build again and the world was going to have the climate that, that we anticipate in 2100, we would make different decisions. We would, uh, we would not put quite so much infrastructure uh, near the waterline. Uh, we, would, uh, we would have adjusted where we're growing grapes and corn and, uh, and tilling soils and chopping down forests and all of these things. And, you know, and we'd pretty much go on the way we were. But that's not the situation. The situation is not whether a warmer climate is intrinsically better than a colder climate. You know, we, uh, you're right, we would, we would just adapt to that. The problem is that we've invested in the climate that we have. We've invested trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars in anticipation of where the shoreline is. Right? And, and we saw that very clearly with, with Sandy and Katrina. Um, we have invested very heavily in the kinds of houses that we build in certain climates, the, certain, the kinds of heating systems and air conditioning systems that we build, the kinds of crop services that we have. Um, uh, all of these things exist because we had a climate that allowed these things to exist. They were based on expectations that that climate was not going to change very much. Those expectations are changing. And that's why we have a problem. Because moving to that mythical world where we're totally happy in a four degree, five degree warmed world is not going to be free. Right? Uh, ask uh, Bloomberg how much the costs of a barrage across the, uh, across the Verrazano Narrows is going to be. Uh, ask the people on the other side of that barrage whether they want that to be there because it's, every time there's a flood it's going to make their floods worse even while it's saving Lower Manhattan. Uh, ask the Venetians how much the Mose project is. Ask the, ba the Bangladeshis what they're going to do because they're not going to build a barrage. Um, you know, where are the you know, 100 million people that live within one meter of sea level going to move to, right? And this is, I mean, that's a lot of people. And in parts of the world that are not necessarily the most open and, frail, and, and welcoming to literally hordes of newcomers. So I, the, the, the costs of this, the issue here, is, is not, you know, how can we get as fast to this sunny uplands that, that one might imagine uh, as possible, but, but what that transition is going to be, and, and who's going to be suffering there, and what the consequences there is for our cultural heritage, for our, for our human capital, uh, for all sorts of, uh, of things along those lines. Um, I, I would add that um, the, obviously a country like the United States or Western Europe, wealthy countries are going to be able to, to some extent, adjust. You know, there are engineering solutions to, um, to, to, a, lot, to a lot of this. Um, but the impacts of climate change are not geographically spread equally. Um, so um, Jason showed the, the maps of future temperatures in Africa, for example, and that came from a study that one of many studies about, you know, how is it that tropical agriculture is going to adapt to temperatures that high? You can't breed crops for temperatures that they have never seen in their whole history of evolution. That's very difficult to do. So there's a real threat of, for example, 
serious declines in tropical agricultural productivity. Now, Africans have done nothing to create this problem, but will be amongst the people who are, you know, get, who are going to experience the most severe consequences. And similarly, when you look at the changes in hydroclimate and the aridification of the Middle East or Northern Africa, um, some of those places will probably become uninhabitable because of, dry, because of drying and a depletion of water resources. And right now, we are, live in a world where migration from those countries to the, the better able to adapt climate countries in more northern latitudes is already restricted. And I don't see anything changing that is going to allow an extra several million climate refugees be able to migrate out of the, the countries that have suffered the worst consequences of, a, of human activities that they had nothing to do with. So um, that's certainly not a, I mean, that may be the world that we are going to, but I, I certainly don't think it's something that I look forward to at all. And our last word. I don't know if I'm going to take the last word, but I just want to, you know, the, the thing I think of it is, as far as this goes is, Think of a mountain, think of the species that have adapted to the different bands of the mountain. If you're the species at the top of the mountain where you've adapted to a certain number of, uh, a certain amount of cold temperatures and precipitation and things warm, the snow line moves up and the temperatures increase. If you're at the top of the mountain, it's not a good place to be because you don't have anywhere else to go. And that's what exists for a lot of uh, people throughout the world as the world warms and what they're going to be able to adjust to, whether it's through sea level rises or changes in temperatures, et cetera. The other thing, so in some senses, it's a, it's a privileged position to make that argument because if you have adaptation uh, capabilities, uh, yeah, chances are you will adapt uh, to some degree and, and make those adaptations in a way that will uh, mitigate or at least reduce the impacts that you uh, experience. But I think that you can also make the argument from a privileged position just by doing a cost-benefit analysis, just by looking, looking at the risks we face and the options that we have in front of us. Yes, we can uh, you know, put the throttle forward, just speed on uh, in the direction that we're going, and we may get there, which might be a problem. Uh, by virtue of the fact that we will suffer a lot of the um, impacts if we continue going in this direction. Some of the other options are not just about mitigating um, this problem, but also mean cleaner energies, more uh, equitable energies, more resilient um, infrastructures to many of the different uh, climatic changes that exist just through internal variability. And so I think when you actually add those things up and you look at the risks and the things that we face in addition to what we could actually achieve if we, if we made sensible responses to this, both in reducing our emissions and uh, finding additional energy supplies and, and taking advantage of those, I think by far, even from a privileged position, it makes a lot more sense to take these risks seriously and uh, build smartly and, and, and invest in alternatives. Okay. Um, we have to wrap it up now. Uh, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, and having these interactions at the end uh, uh, is actually uh, far more interesting for us than, uh, than giving our own opinions again and again and again. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, and uh, I wish you uh, all the best. And uh, maybe we'll see you at the next uh, one of these uh, seminars. Uh, when was the next one? Yeah, April, April 4th. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to you guys. Okay. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> okay. Well, I appreciate it. Because I tend to dance around and it's going to be more comfortable for me. Uh, I jumped in front of Richard because I wanted to save the best for last, of course, but I also think that there's a bit of an arc to what we're trying to accomplish today. Uh, what Gavin has presented is essentially a change of course, this was called Ch -ch changes. Uh, he reported on the changes that we understand in the global mean over time, so looked at these secular changes in the climate system. And what Richard and I would like to do in these latter two talks is talk about extremes and, and changes in extremes. I'm going to take the temperature component, so I'll talk about changes in temperature extremes uh, that have both been observed and what we expect in the future. And then Richard will finish up uh, with hydrological extremes, and so talk about the kinds of changes that we expect with regard to uh, moisture in the climate system. So that's the roadmap and uh, the, the idea behind the arc. And so, as I said, I'm going to take temperature extremes. And of course, what Gavin has already presented sets me up very well to do this. And so I'm going to start where everybody starts when they talk about temperature extremes in the climate system, which is steroids and baseball. So the reason why I want to talk about this and the reason why people often talk about steroids in baseball when they discuss 
extremes in temperature or extremes in the climate system over time is because it's an apt example and it's a useful way of, of discussing these. I'm going to torture it even more than normal today uh, and just set you up for thinking about how to conceptualize changes in temperature extremes within the climate system, both in terms of what we observed, what we've observed, and how they're moving forward. Uh, so, if you're a commissioner who cares about steroids in baseball, you can imagine doing a few different things to try to decide whether or not it's a problem and, it's, and it exists within, the within, the, uh, within your players. What would you imagine doing? All right? How would you imagine testing whether or not this is something that's occurring? And the first thing I would say is that you could drug test your players. All right? And we haven't talked about causes behind some of these changes, but of course lying behind a lot of the discussion we're having today is the cause in the changes that we're observing in the climate system, which I'm not going to spoil the ending here. For many of us, or, or what's been determined uh, time and time again, is the increases in greenhouse gases that have uh, accumulated in the atmosphere over the last century and are expected to continue uh, through the 21st. And so one of the ways that you can think about this example is you could go and test your players for steroids. And similarly, in the climate system, we could go out and look for the causes that we would expect to be causing these changes. And we've done that in broad scale. So one of the ways of thinking about this analogy is going out, measuring the things that we recognize are changing, that we recognize would cause the kinds of temperature changes, changes in temperature extremes to be occurring in the climate system. And if we found steroids in our players or increases in CO2 in the atmosphere, we can associate those changes with the, um, or those changes in atmospheric constituents, the cause, with what we're observing as well in the climate system. The other way, of course, of doing this is to look at statistics. And one of the great things about baseball is that they've been keeping statistics for over a century now, uh, and there's a lot to look at. And so when you think about extremes, one of the useful ways of thinking about this is with regard to home run statistics in baseball. All right, and so the way to imagine this is imagine some of your players start using steroids, getting stronger, hitting the ball harder. What kinds of statistics could you look at to determine whether or not this is a widespread problem within, uh, within the league? And so this is just an example of where someone has done that. And there's a couple ways to think about this. One is to just look at home run statistics over time. So this is home runs uh, since 1960, moving forward through to 2006. These are the number of players with home runs over 45, okay? So you can see these bar graphs here, you know, going back into 1960, uh, mid-20s. And you can look at the numbers increase as you move into what this particular author calls the steroid era. But you can see this significant increase in the number of home runs that occurred uh, during this period of time. And you can imagine that as being a measure of this influence of steroids on the, on, on the league and how players are hitting. Now, there might be other things like rule changes and so on, but you can make a strong argument that something happened here in the way that, in the number of balls that were being hit out of the park and as an indication of the use of, of steroids within the game. I should say that the reason why this is important is because you're looking, similar to what uh, Gavin talked about in terms of spatial variability and noise is at any given time if a player like Barry Bonds hits a ball out of the park, it doesn't mean that's because he's taking steroids. It of course is something that was possible without them, but if you look at the statistics in aggregate, if you look at the individual players or the, the, the numbers for the entire league, this kind of a signal begins to jump out and you can see it. Now another way of thinking about this is through probability distribution. So the other thing that this particular author has done is looked at the expected number of balls hit a certain distance. So this axis here is range in meters, zero meters up through. This is the threshold for home runs. And there's two different distributions on here. There's a red distribution and a blue distribution. And the red distribution is this author's estimate of the distances of the balls that are hit. Of course, there are many balls. Some go out of the park, some don't. Uh, but the distance of the balls hit if you increase the velocities by 4% in all cases. And what you can see is the number of balls that were hit out of the park for this case where the balls were being hit slower is around 10% of this particular distribution. And for the number that was hit with the increase in velocities, it increases to 16.6%. Uh, so roughly a 66% increase in the number of home runs that were hit. All right? And I want you to think about this distribution because it's very useful for thinking about how we consider extremes within the climate system and how we approach uh, many extreme events. In this case, we're going to be thinking about temperature and temperature extremes. All right? So that's the analogy I want you to keep in mind. And now I want to talk more specifically about extremes within the climate system.
So there's different ways that you can get more extremes. All right? And again, we're talking specifically about temperature in this case. But the way I want you to think about this is this is just a typical bell curve all right, with a mean at the peak. And then what we would call, if this is temperature along this axis, what we would call warm extremes might occur up here in the tail of the distribution. And the cold extremes would occur down here in the lower part of the distribution. Now when we talk about standard deviations, all right, usually as we march up this tail, it represents uh, fewer and fewer possibilities of getting those extremes on each side of the distribution. So we usually talk about uh, one standard deviation about the mean as including roughly 66 percent of the variance. As we go up to two, roughly 95. So these extremes exist on the tails as only 5 percent of the, of the occurrences that you would expect. Okay? So if this is your original distribution like temperature, all right, say globally at a given location, you can imagine increasing the number of extremes that you get on the warm end. So this tail in the original distribution is just this part of the pie or this slice. But as you increase the mean, if you take this distribution and you increase the mean, all of a sudden what you call the threshold for your extreme and the number of events it contained in the small part of the distribution now includes this much larger part. So one way of getting more warm extremes in the climate system is simply by increasing the mean. And Gavin very convincingly showed how we are increasing the mean both globally and in specific locations. And that for temperature is a very useful way of thinking about how we increase extremes. You'll also notice that we've reduced the cold extremes. So in the increase of this distribution, we've moved this tail out of the area that we would have considered very cold extremes. All right? So in that case, we've increased the number of warm extremes, reduced the number of uh, cold extremes. Well, we can do other things with this distribution too. We can squash it down. So again, this is our original distribution. We can squash it down and increase the length of the tails on either side. In this case, what we've done, again, here is the original number of, say, hot days or hot weather and the number of cold weather. And as we've increased the distribution and made the tails to lay farther out, we've increased now, if you look at the area under the curve, we've increased the number of events occurring within those extremes as well. And we've done it symmetrically. So we've now, in this case, increased the number of cold events reduce the number of, uh, and increase the number of warm events. And I should say the other important thing here is that within these distributions, look at the dark reds and dark blues here. These are extremes that would have never been possible in the previous climate. So see how the, the distribution only goes up to here roughly? This part of the distribution that we now include in the shifted distribution, whether we've changed the mean or increased the variance, now exists in a case where those are extreme or, or, or temperatures that are warm or cold in a scenario that we would have never expected to have given that previous distribution. All right? And then, of course, what we can do uh, with these two different cases is put them together where we have both a mean shift and a variance shift, which in the case of, say, a warmer climate includes now even more extreme events lying above that part of the distribution that we previously thought of as the cutoff for our extremes. All right? And in many cases, depending on the extremes you're talking about, you're doing one or both of these things. All right? And so in terms of temperature, one of the easiest things to think about is, again, this changing mean. It's something that Gavin went through and talked about. And it's a very straightforward response to what you would expect in a changing climate if you did nothing else from the distribution. So one of the nice things about temperature extremes, it's a very easily to conceptualize just through a changing mean in the climate, just through a forcing that would cause the climate to gradually warm over time. Even if you keep the same distribution, you would expect to see an increase in temperature extremes because you've shifted the mean of the distribution. All right? And so this is very consistent with the idea of global warming, with what we'd expect in a warming climate. And one of the things that we can do now, just like steroids in baseball and looking at uh, home run statistics, we can go into the climate system, look at observations, and see if there's evidence for changes in these extreme events uh, in various locations about the world. So a canonical example of this, of course, is the European heat wave in 2003. Uh, some of you may remember this event. Was anyone in Europe at the time? Anyone? So a few of you. Was it hot? <laughs> All right, it was a warm summer, a very warm summer, several standard deviations above the long-term mean. So this is the Central Europe uh, June, July, August temperature. So we're looking at summer temperatures now. This is going back to about the mid-1700s. And you can see how those summer temperatures vary over time. And this is the 2003 event. All right, so it was a very warm event. This is, of course, just in, uh, as a measure in Central Europe, but all over Europe at the time uh, when it was a very uh, warm summer. And 
In this particular uh, summary, the, the IPCC, I, I hope many of you probably are aware of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but of course it represents this consortium of scientists who look at the field of climate science every five to seven years, make an assessment about the state of the science. And these were the statements they made about that particular heat wave in 2003 in Europe, uh, calling it both the hottest summer since 1780 where they were using these actual observational records but then they also said it was the hottest since at least 1500 based on natural archives that what we call paleoclimate archives that preserve uh, records of past change. I can update that today with uh, a paper that's actually in preparation that I'm working on with my European colleagues where we've done reconstructions now back over 2,000 years. So this is going back to prior to uh, the turn of the first well, back to 1 AD and a little bit beforehand, uh, up through 2000. Here is that European summer temperature, and it still remains the warmest temperature in this estimate back over 2,000 years, so back to Roman times. You can also, there's some interesting things in this curve showing that the Roman times were actually quite warm. Uh, the period we know as the medieval climate anomaly was also quite warm. But even against those background periods, 2003 stands out as the warmest summer temperature uh, recorded in these proxies over that time interval. The other thing that you should note is this is very consistent with the way that we talked about these distributions generally. So what this is showing is the distribution of summer temperatures between 1961 and 1990 in blue. All right, the frequency of temperatures. This is summer, June, July, August temperature uh, distribution. And this is the distribution for that summer temperature uh, for those summer temperatures in 2003 in Europe. And you can very much see that distributional shift in the mean, in particular, in Europe during that summer. And it's very consistent with the way that we would think about these extremes. So most of the summer, the average of the summer, was well, was very close to uh, one or two standard deviations already above the long-term mean distribution. So a significant part of the entire summer was uh, well above the mean and in many cases above the warmest temperatures that had been recorded in Europe at the time. Uh, so it was a big event. I like to appeal to the IPCC in terms of summarizing some of these observations and extreme events because at the end of the day I'm just one schmuck who's standing up here and talking to you about uh, things from my perspective. But what this really represents is a collective uh, synthesis of the science as it stands every, every five to seven years. And I think it's worth reading these statements because it really does represent a wide consensus on what we know about extremes and, and what we understand about them. So this is their statement in 2007. There'll be a new report coming out next year, but this is the synthesis as it stood uh, in 2007. Changes in extremes of temperatures are also consistent with warming of the climate. Again, this idea that I've already presented. A widespread reduction in the number of frost days in mid-latitude regions, an increase in the number of warm extremes, and a reduction in the number of daily cold extremes are observed in 70 to 75 percent of the land regions where data are available. The most marked changes are for cold, so that low end of the distribution uh, the lowest 10% based on the 6190 mean night, which have become rarer over the 51 to 2003 period. So cold nights have become much rarer, and warm nights have become much more frequent, all right? The highest 10% of those distributions. So again, very consistent with this idea and the shift of the distribution, what we would expect under these warming scenarios. So if we take a, a, a global view of this, there's, there's different ways that this can be mapped. Now, Gavin has already shown you anomalies. So this is, again, are those spatial maps of anomalies, but in this case, it's just June, July, August temperatures, all right, with a base period of 1951 to 1980. And what this, these maps are doing is stepping through the years. This is 1955, 65, 75, and then these are the last several uh, years. So it's 06, 07, 08, 09, 2010, and 2011. And what is being plotted is the temperature anomalies relative to that base period. And if you just look at the way this is going, you're of course seeing many more red periods representing the warmer periods on these scales. And note these are actually different scalings uh, here. But the point is, is that the regions are getting warmer relative to that historical mean. All right, so that's something that Gavin already showed you. But now if you think about these distributions, you think in terms of standard deviations, I think it's a very interesting plot to look at when you look at the same maps, all right, but what these colors now represent is the numbers of standard deviations above the long-term mean that exist, all right? So what these represent is as you go up in numbers here from two to three and so on, the number of standard deviations that you're stepping out on that distribution, that probability distribution. And what this is showing is that in most cases, the warm temperatures that are being seen are statistically 
what you would, would be very rare statistically what you would expect from this earlier distribution. So that these are things that you would not expect to see without a shift in the distribution. If we just assume that historical distribution, these are events, warming events at all these locations that you would not expect to be seeing otherwise. All right? And you can see, I mean, this is a scary progression in terms of the, the standard deviations away from that long-term mean that we would expect. So I want to finally say something about the future. So Gavin talked about what the observations are. Of course, that's what I've been doing. I want to just show you a couple uh, estimates of how we expect things to change into the future. So these are the distributions for the first, uh, well, from 2020 to 2029, and then the distribution at the end of the 21st century in the global mean for different scenarios. All right? So these scenarios represent different assumptions about the choices we're going to make uh, as societies, how much greenhouse, how we're going to change our mix of, of energy and so on. But what they all show is if you accept this as an initial distribution within the century, this increase in the mean and also a tendency towards warmer events later, uh, higher up on the distribution. All right? So that's again consistent with what uh, we've already talked about. But now this is an interesting map showing how the summers are expected to change by looking at the number of events that are above any previous warm temperatures uh, relative to the baseline. All right? So what 100% represents here is the number of days that are warmer than any other temperature that had been seen that summer uh, in the distribution. So what it's saying is that large parts of the land masses, 100% of the summer events are warmer than what we would have called the most extreme events previously. All right? So this again is a measure of what we expect to see in the changes and how we're expecting to move into a regime that in many cases in terms of extreme events are things that we haven't even seen yet. So this is the tail end of the distribution that's getting above all of those extreme events that we previously uh, had experience for which were already way out on the distribution. These are things that don't even exist at this point uh, on the distributions. All right? So it's a sobering idea in terms of what our adaption is going to need to look like, what we're used to presently and what these extremes will look like uh, moving into the end of the century. And finally, I just want to leave with a couple thoughts of why we care. All right? So we've looked very specifically at temperature extremes and in some cases they get short shrift uh, to things like cyclones and other maybe more uh, immediately catastrophic events. But if you actually look at the impacts that temperature extremes have on societies, they are numerous and in some cases um, more destructive when you add them all up. So of course there are health impacts. Uh, warm summers of course impact disproportionately uh, the, the elderly and people without access to summer shelters, etc. So these have, uh, as I mentioned with the um, European heat wave, the reported deaths associated with that 2003 uh, heat wave are around 70,000. So a lot of people die during these very extreme events. Of course infrastructure damages, when we think about sustainability and moving forward, uh, making ourselves more resilient to the changes that we expect to happen. Uh, transportation can be affected, roads buckle, train lines kink, uh, airports close because air airplanes can't get as much lift in warm weather. If you don't believe me, try flying out of Phoenix uh, in late summer where they do have fairly consistent uh, airplane uh, airport closures. Higher demand for energy, power line sag can cause power outages, etc. Water resources are stressed um, as for instance, infrastructure that's susceptible to heat has to be watered down to maintain, its, uh, to maintain colder temperatures like bridges that are susceptible to these things. Forest fires, of course, are uh, susceptible to both hydrological change as well as temperature change, but we certainly uh, will expect more of these moving forward. It's something that we've already seen. And then agriculture uh, is, of course, also affected. Livestock mortality. Uh, animals are people too, of course, and they're affected in the same way that many humans are uh, to these extreme temperatures. And one of the most disconcerting things uh, is crop yields. It's been, uh, I think, worked out over the last several uh, years that many crops can be fairly drought resistant. Of course, droughts uh, include both te precip and temperature effects. But there's certain things that are grown, for instance, in the tropics that just don't have much room to go in terms of how they will respond to very warm temperatures. And it's expected that crop yields will certainly fall and mortality uh, will be the consequence of some of these more extreme temperatures, particularly in the tropics moving into the 21st century. So those are things to think about. Oh, and I should just say it's going to cost us 
a lot too. Of course, this uh, includes many things uh, as far as weather disasters are concerned, but these are the number of events over time back to 1980 up through uh, present day. The number of events over costing the U.S. over a billion dollars. You can see this uh, trend just like the temperature uh, data. This is infl inflation adjusted, uh, and it is something that's going to cost us more as we move into these more extreme environments. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Richard and, and Peter. Are you going to introduce him again? I think we're supposed to wait for questions until the end. Uh, this is just a technical question. How do you, uh, how do people get data on those remote parts of the Pacific Ocean? Like, where are you getting those temperatures from, basically? It's for me. Or, uh, um, yeah. Well, I mean, these nowadays, nowadays, a lot of them come from from satellite observations, but historically, they came from ship observations, which. Um, Ship observations uh, were routinized beginning in 1856 by the European and American navies. So now it's augmented by satellites, and also we have all sorts of other buoys out there and so on. So that data's, uh, that data's pretty good. And girls? I think you said boys. <laughs> right. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, in the year 2006, Al Gore warned that we had a 10-year window to make changes before climate change becomes irreversible. Do you think that was um, an alarmist claim, or do you agree with him? So for all intents and purposes, climate change is irreversible. I mean, we've already passed that point. When we're not going to see a climate like the, the, the 1950s again. No, none of us are going to see that. Um, what we've done to, uh, to, to Arctic ice, uh, for instance, we're not going to we're not going to recover that. So uh, the, the time scales that politicians use when they say these kinds of things, we have four years to act, we have ten years to act. All that, what, what they're trying to to express is that there's a lot of inertia in the system, right? Uh, we haven't caught up. The climate hasn't caught up with uh, things that we put into the atmosphere ten or twenty years ago. Right? So right now, we're storing up problems because the planet as a whole is, is, you know, is still catching up. And if we keep moving the goalposts, right, the planet has more to catch up to. So when you, when you go forward with those projections and you say, okay, well, how long does it take to you know, rearrange your energy supply? How long does it take to you know, change all the things that we're doing that are contributing to this? Uh, it's, a, it's a long time, right? It's, it's 20, 30, 40, 50 years for all of that infrastructure to get changed, adapted, uh, you know, replaced. Um, and so if you don't start soon, then what you end up with is, is, you, is you, you're building in emissions into the system that you know, in 10 years' time, we'll be stuck with, right? And so the more that we invest in, you know, fossil fuel delivery systems and infrastructure that relies on fossil fuels particularly, uh, then, you know, we're just building in more and more emissions for the future, and so a larger and larger impact uh, by the time we get out to 2030, 2050, you know, 2100. Um, so it's not that anything terrible is going to particularly happen in uh, 2016 or 2014 or something. I mean, I'm sure terrible things will happen in those years, but I don't think they'll be related to anything Al Gore was talking about. Uh, but you know, there there is a there's a time scale for um, for, for for policies that that are needed in order to prevent like much much larger changes going on in the future and, and that's that's really the problem here the problem is if, if it was if it was a, a, a thing that well we have to act now because there's something terrible going to happen tomorrow right then people would do it it would be an acute problem it would be like the asteroid coming and it's going to destroy us okay we would mobilize we would do everything in our power to stop that happening but what we're talking about here is is much more of a chronic problem right uh it's something that is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse but every year it's just going to get a little bit more worse I, right? i'm may i add to that no nope, sure i think the other challenge you know there, there's often discussions about danger 
dangerous levels of carbon dioxide, and sometimes these discussions are couched in that. And people talk about 350, 450. What's a what's a threshold that we should be um, targeting? And I think it's useful to think about targets as as uh, spurring actions. But the other thing that is difficult to quantify, and I think one of the reasons why this is a, a really difficult question is there are parts of the climate system that work like dials. So as we turn up the CO2, we could potentially go back to where we were if we turned it back down. And there are a lot of things that work like thresholds. And so one of the you know, scary things about understanding what dangerous levels of CO2 might be is quantifying those thresholds. We know there are feedbacks in the climate system that once we, we pass a certain threshold, no matter what we do, we're going to be on a trajectory where the climate system takes over and, and may go into a completely different state. The problem is, is it's very hard to predict where those thresholds lie. And so there's certainly a conservative principle that I think we should all apply, which is we don't, I think we can all agree, we don't want to go past some of these thresholds like melting enough permafrost where we start emitting enough um, methane into the atmosphere that, you know, all of a sudden that signal becomes significant or where we melt uh, the ice caps back far enough where regardless of what happens, they will continue to melt because of the feedbacks involved there. And so, you know, this issue of thresholds is one of the things that we have the least uh, that we have our fingers on the least in terms of quantifying and understanding where exactly those might be, but they could uh, be some of the largest impacts, and we just don't know where we cross those in the climate system at this point. We know they exist, but we don't know exactly where the CO2 level is that would put us past those. <laughs> My understanding is that there are some uh, effects that are like multipliers and basically become vicious circles, like, for example, the warming of the oceans and things like that. Can you talk about those things where they actually just compound and they're pretty much unstoppable? Kind of like going back to the previous question, but specifically, I guess, talking about the oceans when they warm up, what effects they have with the reflection of the heat and all that. I'll give you just a couple of quick examples and, and the rest of the panel can weigh in. One of the, f so these are feedbacks is what we're talking about and there can be positive or negative feedbacks, things that either enhance the degree of change or feedback to reduce the degree of change. And a couple of positive feedbacks that we think about are the what we call the ice albedo feedback. So as we melt uh, ice in the polar regions, that when it's there acts like a big mirror. So it reflects a lot of the incoming sunlight, and as a result, we don't absorb that uh, energy, and, and that energy then isn't used to warm the planet. Uh, when we melt the ice and replace it with dark ocean waters, we now absorb a lot more of that uh, incident solar energy, and as a result, enhance the warming uh, that occurs. So that's one. Clouds are another big question. Clouds can actually be work as positive or negative feedbacks. And one of the challenges is that they're some of the hardest things to model in the climate system. And you know, there's been a lot of research uh, done in how to incorporate cloud changes into climate models and, and how they might uh, change into the future. Uh, but to be honest, that's one of the areas that we still don't have a complete understanding of how clouds will change. And I should say, they, the way they work is they can reflect more sunlight. So depending on the kinds of clouds you have, you might reflect more sunlight if you're forming more clouds into a warming planet. Uh, but they also can absorb long wave radiation and work to, to further warm the planet. And so the balance of that moving forward is something that we're still working out. Do you guys want to add to feedbacks? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's lots of these, these different kind of amplifying factors. This isn't the same as, uh, you know, something going completely out of control, like, like, a, like a feedback on a, on a mic or something. We're not, we're not, you know, you, these things it, it, uh, amplify the change, but they don't take it into some huge new state. And we're not going to end up um, living on planet Venus, at least, you know, not for another five billion years or so. So, you know, these amplifiers get talked about a lot, like the methane. Uh, from permafrost gets talked about a lot, uh, but it would really need to warm a lot before we thought that that was going to be a big player in what's happening. I mean, there are carbon cycle feedbacks, so, you know, uh, as the temperatures warm, it's harder to dissolve carbon dioxide in the ocean, and that's where it's all going to end up eventually, uh, and so that leaves more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so that's a, a slight amplifier. But, you know, they're part of the system, uh, and, and we need to be paying attention to them, but they're not, they're not the difference between us being here and then us going off like that. I mean, all of those things that you're seeing, the trends that you're seeing, all of those include a certain degree of amplification from the factors that we've already talked about. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the feedbacks related to sea ice, water vapor, clouds, you know, are, of course, within the climate models whose results we were 
presenting from today. So the methane one, the, or carbon cycle feedbacks, prob probably aren't, but the, all the feedbacks that we consider to be the most important are in there. So they aren't, none of them are, are causing a runaway situation. Yeah. You displayed a, a graph of the Canadian uh, temperature changes that was hiding data. Was it a political graph, or is it um, reflecting the fact that in Canada it's a very conservative government and they're trying to promote tar sands and pipelines uh, and such? Or is it so that was the National Post. If you if you know oh. the National Post, I mean it, it's uh, it's a kind of Wall Street Journal want to be, um, uh, along with their the Wall Street Journal's peculiar take on the the, the world from their op-ed page. So they're trying to have their own peculiar take. So it it's very much a political newspaper, um, uh, but always has been, uh, and it's not related particularly to the current Canadian government's uh, stances. Though I'm sure that they support that. <laughs>